name's Julie Johnson. Um, I just wanted to start today with that reflection, just kind of as a way to get you thinking about what it is you already do in your courses um, related to assessment, related to um, distributed learning over time. And we're going to talk about some of the uh, theory and terms that are related to especially assessment today. Um, and I know that many of you are here because Canvas is in the title of these sessions, right? You really want us to talk about Canvas and to dive into Canvas. Um, so I know that we always have to work out some kinks with technology, so uh, hopefully we are all in the Canvas course together um, and we can do some demos. And I would really like to give you time today to build something in Canvas. So um, as you can see, our session objectives for today. So first, I want to make sure that you are networking with one another um, so that you know maybe who you can reach out to uh, for ideas or questions or support. We're going to reflect a little bit on learning and assessment theory. I don't want to get too deep into the theory, um, but we'll just touch on it enough so that you can really start to reflect on your own classes and your own approaches. And then also, um, we are going to try and apply these different assessment strategies to our courses. And I would like you to build two things in Canvas today. So I'm going to try and give you, depending on how our discussion goes, about 20 or 30 minutes at the end um, of at least our uh, activity and discussion where you actually get to go into a Canvas course. If you already have a sandbox, uh, that's great. Um, if you don't know what a sandbox is, a sandbox uh, is essentially a Canvas course that you can apply for. Um, you just sign up for it. And it's just a Canvas course where no students have access to it and you get to try out different, um, maybe you want to try out HTML code, maybe you want to try um, and see what, what quizzes look like. Um, what you were all just doing right now, I called it a survey, um, but that's actually part of the Canvas quiz, uh, quizzing function. And I set it up so that it was worth zero points. You can do that in your own classes at the beginning of the semester to maybe get a sense of where your students are coming from. Um, what's, you know, what's their hometown? What's their major? What do they want to learn in your class? Um, so you got to already engage in one Canvas item. So those are our objectives today. We're going to go ahead and get started um, with a little getting to know you activity, just so that you can get to know each other. Uh, we'll stick with just getting to know our tables for today, but you can absolutely branch out um, during the break and after the session. So what you're going to do is you are going to all come to this back table and you are going to grab a picture and you're going to bring this picture back to your table and you are going to introduce yourselves around the table so for example my name is julie johnson um share where you uh are coming from on campus so i am a phd student in the department of educational psychology hopefully on my last lap um, this year so, and I selected this image um, to represent something about my teaching. Something about my teaching, or my approach to teaching in the class. I don't really know why I picked this it's randomly, but let's go with it. Um, so, this represents my teaching because I like to surprise my students on a daily basis with something that they've never learned before, or maybe to see something in a new way with new eyes. That um, so your task is the same, so go ahead and grab an image, bring it back to your table, and we'll share around the table. All right, I think everybody's done. Okay, um, so we'll bring it back. Uh, we want to look at them. I know how to look for them. So I know that we don't always love icebreakers or doing getting to know you activities, but I do these on a regular basis in my classes, um, and I teach large lecture classes. <laughs> um, in the EdTech department. So what's really nice about them is it really kind of creates this comfort zone, right? Just at your little tables now, you roughly know people's names or you're really bad at things like I am. Um, and they just went in one ear and out the other, but that's okay. At least you have a sense of who you're sitting with. Um, and this creates comfort for uh, future discussions that we're gonna have. So we um, completed our first objective, which is getting to know other um, teaching and learning enthusiasts. And now what we're going to do is we're going to move into actually talking about assessment and how we approach um, our own learning. So if you all want to uh, flip to page two of your handout. So 
we're all going to participate in this activity. And what we're going to do, um, so I'll just go ahead and read the instructions. So you have been tasked with learning a new skill. So you personally. Whether that's playing an instrument, maybe you want to learn how to master chess, maybe you're doing, want to learn how to do your own taxes. Um, anything that you can envision for yourself that you want to learn. And you are given 15 weeks to learn this new skill, at the end of which you need to demonstrate mastery. How do you go about learning this new skill? Consider the following scenarios. Circle your two favorite and your two least favorite and jot down some reasons why. If you need to jot down your final thoughts, that's fine. But what I'd like you to do next is to partner with the person sitting next to you. And I want you to share um, your favorites and least favorites with one another. So I want to bring it back to the big group and kind of talk about some of these. Um, first of all, how many of you agreed entirely with your partner? <laughs> wow, we had a pair. Wow, two pairs. Yes. Wow. Oh, you guys know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's start with A. What do we think about A? Everyone love A. A big fan of A. I like. You like A? Yeah. Why? I think it's nice. To, I often find the fact that learning and teaching from somebody who's a little above me or I'm a little bit above somebody else. That's a giant gap. They see better, but it's a high person's not. It's a better person. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what else? Um, I like it for the simple fact that a lot of our students are nervous to come speak with us. Mm -hmm. So working with somebody that, that they consider a peer kind of flow or not that anxiety. Sure. What about TAs? Do TAs count? It's kind of like a less intimidating kind of faculty. I'm not intimidating. He's a TA and I'm not. Oh. I, would, I would say yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Um, what about A? Yeah. Okay. Anyone not a huge fan? Yeah? Why? I would be too intimidated by a person who already mastered it, and I'd rather have time alone to make mistakes and work through things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, some of us would rather just work through things on our own and not necessarily either be forced to work with someone or have to um, work with someone. Absolutely. Okay. Well, now they've only been doing taxes for a year longer. <laughs> <laughs> we, we reacted the same way that you know I'd rather do it on our own. But as soon as you started talking about oh, I'd like to work with somebody um, a little above me, I remember that um, I, when I used to go skiing, that was skiing with my brother. It was just a little better than. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, or, you know, in a, so I'm in a PhD program, and I've been sort of in the tailwind of this other individual who's been a year ahead of me, and it's yeah. just really, you know, it's nice to see, like, oh, they were able to do that, so I can do that, too. Well, you just pushed yeah. me a little bit. Yeah. It wasn't too much, but just a little bit. Sure. <laughs> Anything else about A? Okay, what about B? Anyone love B? Yeah, we do. Oh, yeah. oh, great, excellent, tell me why. Be because, um, well, my example was um, uh, having to learn something new in order to be able to teach a class about it. So I would learn it, I'd spend, I actually took an online class, the most recent time I'm thinking of, I took an online class to learn systems analysis, and then I had to build that into a new class that I was designing. So, yeah, it, it, I had to make something with my new skills. So, that's what I did. Sure, yeah, what else? Yeah. Um, I guess, so I was like contrasting B and F as two different forms of assessing the skill. And I think, I mean, I heard other people talking about this too, but I just feel like um, performing a skill is a much better assessment of whether or not you can do it than taking multiple choice tests, which is just kind of like focused on content knowledge. Sure. So. All right. Anyone not a huge fan of B? Not, oh. not at all. Yeah, no. I, uh, <laughs> I, 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 uh, my, my philosophy of assessment is it's also to do with process, not to do with product. But basically, I want to find out the processes that people go through mm -hmm. in order to 
arrive at a particular point. I'm not interested so much in where, where they are, except in, in particular cases where you have to demonstrate a skill in public or something like that, like, like playing the guitar, um, something like that. I mean, yeah, obviously, that has a, that, 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 that's an important thing. But in, in terms of learning, I just want to know how people learn, not, not what they learn or, or what the, the end result is. All right. What about C? What do you think of C? Anyone love C? Yeah, I love C. Okay. <laughs> what do we love about C? The consistency yeah. is a big, big factor, especially in language learning. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, what else? You get, get into a pattern, you just get into your lifestyle, your, your plan, <clears throat> your schedule. Yeah, absolutely. Um, does anybody, does anybody uh, have difficulty with C? Like you wish that this could happen, <laughs> and it doesn't really. Well, it's an ideal. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Well, absolutely. Marie says some, has something to say about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, we've talked about it, but it's hard to build an hour a day to your life right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But also the the last the words the the, the, without word. peer or mentor feedback or evaluation. Like, if I don't get any evaluation or feedback on it, I can go down a, a wrong path pretty deeply. By itself, so, right? Progress. By itself, it doesn't work. Yeah, and for some tasks, I bet, you know, if there are tasks that have, like, riding a unicycle, right? I don't need somebody else to tell me I fell off <laughs> that unicycle. I can see that myself, right? So I can, you know, for some tasks, it'll work, but. Uh -huh. sure. Anything else we missed about C? Yeah. I guess I, I looked at it a bit differently. Um, so I always encourage my students, not necessarily an hour, that's ideal, maybe 15 minutes, because there's so many online resources our students, they're on the bus for 15 to 20 minutes. They can pull up a YouTube video, go to Khan Academy, or Duolingo in the case of, of Spanish, which is perfect, but it's still some type of um, immediate feedback and input that I think they could take advantage of. I say, hey, you're sitting on the toilet, you're already on your phone. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I hope you're yeah. not on your phone, but you probably are. It's a future YouTube channel, Toilet Talks, right? <laughs> we have a, yeah. We have a marketing channel. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, something I like about C is, it depends on why I'm learning. If this is a hobby, if it's something I'm doing because I really want to, I'm the judge of whether I'm getting what I want out of it. Absolutely. Okay, what about D? Who's not a big fan of D? Okay, why? Well, have you ever heard much from your life? Um, yeah, I mean, I think just in general cramming is, is a consistent part of learning. I think that you know, the connection you make from learning that skill, all in one sit down. Yeah, I just, I, I, I step through not being a bad learner. Mm -hmm. yeah. What else? It's not effective, but it's probably my favorite. Yes. <laughs> it's the one that yeah. I can do all the time. Absolutely. And I know even as I'm doing it, I, I should have started time. three weeks ago <laughs> or whatever, but this is the first time that I, you know, maybe I thought I had it and then I start getting into it and it's like after the first 15, 20 minutes, like, Oh crap! There's so much more I need to know, and then it turns into the five-hour session. Yeah. But yeah, and maybe, maybe instead of um, twice in a 15-week cycle, maybe we're doing this every two weeks over a couple of years, right? What else? I was just gonna say hi, I'm John. And I'm somebody who likes this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, John. Why? <laughs> Tell us why. I find it effective. I'm not sort of good in parallel, so scheduling eight tasks every day for me means I'll get nothing done. Mm -hmm. And I don't totally enjoy this, but it's how I actually accomplish things, that I mm -hmm. focus on one task and work my tail off on it and uh, get it done. Sure. And I think it's good for students, too, even though it's not fashion, I say so. Yeah. That exact same for students, actually. And yeah. I schedule my course to require this about eight times for the course. Sure, absolutely, right? So um, we kind of refer to this as sort of being in the zone, right? You could get into a five-hour, 
zone of maybe something that you're learning. Um, I'm trying to learn guitar. I wish I could play guitar for five hours, but my fingers tend to start hurting, and I can't. Um, <laughs> so that's my excuse, at least. Uh, but five hours, you know, every once in a while, I'll have to write a paper, and I'll go to a coffee shop and sit down, and five hours later, I feel really good about what I've accomplished and what I've produced. Yeah. At the same time, you can't keep up that stamina over many, many, many hours, and eventually you're going to have not that great of a product yeah. to show out of it. Oh, yeah. And if you had to submit you know, that paper that you wrote in five hours, as soon as that five hours is up, is that really going to be really, no, it's not going to be the greatest, but it might be a good first draft and something to jump off of, yeah. What else? Mm -hmm. I think it's important to take it some context here, too, because if it's, because it's a, like we were talking about, if it's a, it's a hobby, you know, that might not be something that's very stressful, versus if you're learning a skill for something that you need to demonstrate soon, mm -hmm. that might cause a lot of that stress.
any of these in isolation really isn't ideal, right? But if we combine them um, in different ways, then we do find um, something that might work for different learning styles, right? Some of us love the multiple choice at the end of the semester. Some of us would rather just learn quietly every day on our own. Um, so what I'm gonna do really quick is I'm just gonna um, go through a couple of key terms that are related to uh, what we've been talking about. Oh, you did? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so on this next page, you're going to see uh, I created a chart, and it has essentially these kind of four themes that we're going to talk about just very briefly that you can reflect on in your own time with how exactly you want to approach uh, learning and assessment in your own course. Um, and basically, these just sort of give a key term to what we've essentially already been talking about in some of those examples. Um, so for the first one, scaffolding. Um, so scaffolding uh, emerges from work of Vygotsky um, and his zone of proximal development. So this idea of the ZPD, the zone of proximal development, is this idea that um, we all have a stretch zone. So this sort of area of learning that's a little bit beyond what we can kind of handle without assistance um, or maybe help from another uh, more expert other um, and that this is sort of the best area for us to be in to learn. Rather than a panic zone, which is going to be that sort of too difficult, too much information coming at you, too many activities, um, you know, sort of that stressful area. Uh, and then we also don't want our students to be in the comfort zone where they aren't being challenged at all. Um, and scaffolding really, uh, really emphasizes this idea of receiving guidance and assistance from another person. So it's really this social uh, learning aspect. So helping uh, guiding the learner uh, beyond what they already know. So this would be, in our example, um, A and E, right? Sitting down with another individual or sitting down with um, maybe a mentor or expert in the field. I do have some um, examples of sort of how you can provide scaffolding in your courses um, listed here. So for example, if you do do writing assignments, um, provide a sample, right? So this is what I'm looking for in a paper. This was submitted by a student. I've taken off you know, their name and any identifiers. Uh, and this is what I'm really looking for as an A paper. And tell them why, right? That really scaffolds um, that kind of activity. Offering those small reading quizzes throughout the semester would really scaffold uh, sort of that large multiple choice exam at the end. Um, that's sort of a form of scaffolding. And then um, under each of these, I also wrote down really quickly uh, how this benefits instructors. So using these approaches, um, how will this benefit you, your time, um, how you interact with students, your relationship with students, right? So using scaffolding techniques, um, can clarify instructions for students, demonstrates what mastery looks like. Um, if they are doing maybe peer assignments, right, that could be a form of scaffolding. Um, maybe they're seeing what their peers are capable of or what their peers are doing or how their peers are progressing. Uh, and that could also um, be helpful for you as the instructor. Um, and then we have masked and uh, mass, we call it, say, versus distributed practice. Um, you can combine both of these in your uh, course. So the idea of mass practice is that maybe daily or weekly practice of learning, maybe taking quizzes, maybe writing summaries of the readings. Um, so that would be your, uh, sorry, that would be your distributed. So it's distributed over time. Um, your mass practice is going to be the cramming, um, maybe for the midterm and final. So that's a mass practice. And again, um, using these two in conjunction could be really beneficial for the students, and it could be beneficial for you too, right? If the students feel like, oh, I have to demonstrate all this knowledge and skill with just two multiple choice tests in a semester, they might not feel that that's fair, right? They might 
feel like, oh, it's more fair if you give them quizzes um, over time to, to provide that distributed practice um, or maybe other assignments. So there's some other examples and benefits listed there as well. The next one is formative versus summative feedback. Um, and basically formative feedback is the feedback that we use to assess how our students are doing over time um, as they're forming knowledge or as they're progressing uh, through learning a new skill. It's essentially designed to, give, uh, designed to give feedback so that students know what direction maybe they're going in a wrong direction or what direction they should be going in. And then the summative feedback is designed to evaluate overall progress and achievement at the end. And that's necessary, right? You want students to emerge from your class having learned whatever it is you want them to learn in your class, right? So that they can go on um, uh, and take future classes or uh, achieve success in their major program. And then finally, low versus high stakes. So low stakes assignments, again, are gonna be those more distributed assignments. Um, your low stake assignments could also be the only assignments that you give. Maybe you're giving low stake assignments throughout the entire semester um, so that you don't have to give a high stake, uh, maybe exam or final paper. Now you might want to use these in conjunction with one another. Um, but the thing about high stakes is if you are going to do high stakes, consider what are you going to do if your students submit that paper that's worth 70% of their grade late, right? Are you going to give them a zero, which essentially says that they fail? Um, how are you gonna handle that situation? If they miss one of the two exams that you offer, um, how are you gonna handle that situation? Um, and that's a personal preference, right? So some professors say, hey, you, uh, you need to learn how to be on time, you need to learn how to be there, you need to learn how to be to, to finish things um, in a timely manner, but um, others might provide other options. So you just kind of have to reflect uh, on what approach it is you would like to take and what kind of relationship you want to have with your students. So um, with that, I wanted to give you guys a 10 minute break and we'll come back and kind of debrief, debrief a little bit. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna do a quick uh, demo of a course that I put together. Um, it actually, I, I have not used this uh, course yet with students. It's not complete, but it's just sort of a demo of some different options that you might want to use uh, in your own course. And um, I will try to talk about sort of everything as I go through. But if you have a specific question, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, if you do want me to touch on something specifically uh, on the Canvas homepage where you um, were at the beginning of this session, there's a button that you can click that will take you to a Google Doc. You can enter any specific suggestion you would like um, at that Google Doc. Okay, so, um, uh, so first things first, so this is uh, my sandbox course. So I requested this, no students have access to it. Um, so unfortunately, that will limit what I can show you as far as <coughs> student view goes. Um, one thing that I will say about student view is it's, it's pretty accurate, um, but sometimes what, when you click student view, it is not exactly what students see uh, in your course. So one thing you might want to do, especially if you have a TA, uh, is maybe uh, make that TA a student every once in a while just to make sure that everything looks uh, the way that you really want it to look, um, especially maybe at the beginning of um, the semester and as you go along. Um, okay, so what I chose to do for my home page is I created a page. Um, and a page in Canvas is essentially like an HTML page, so you can um, add pictures to it, you can um, you know, really kind of make it your own. You also don't have to be very advanced. <laughs> um, it has a rich content editor. So let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, so it's simply a page. And this is what I mean by rich content editor, right? I can make things bold, I can make things underlined, I can change font colors. 
Um, it very easily, there's a picture symbol, I can embed an image. Uh, one thing that I will recommend if you want to put uh, large files like videos, um, especially videos on your um, course, I recommend embedding the videos rather than uploading the files themselves um, because you have a limit of one gig of space in each course. So each course that you have um, has that limit. Uh, so like the way that you would embed an image, so you can, so if you use Kaltura to record uh, lectures, you can embed a Kaltura video. Um, if you have a box account, you can, um, you can embed anything for your box account. So whether that's a, a file, like a Word document or an Excel um, spreadsheet, something like that. There's also other external um, tools, so like Google Apps. Um, so I could embed, for example, um, my handout for today. So I'm going to embed the demo suggestions, and then that shows up there, and I'll hit save, and we can all kind of see what that looks like. So now at the bottom of my home page, I've embedded this Google Doc, and, and actually, um, can we see the you guys editing yeah. it, it's a live Google Doc, uh, I can edit it too right here in Canvas. So that's kind of a nice feature. Um, so in order to set this as my home page, um, I had to go to the all pages. And these are all different pages that I've created for this course. Um, so again, these aren't files, these are actually pages. Um, so in order to add a page, you just click add a page under the uh, pages tab, um, you know, and you can add whatever content you would like. You can use these pages in a module and then have students go from one page to another? Absolutely. Module, right? Yep, so his question was um, you can in, you can then insert these pages into the modules and then you can have students go from page to page um, within that module. Yep, and absolutely you can. Now there's two buttons here. There's one that says save and there's one that says save and publish. Um, if I just want to save it and I'm not ready for students to see it yet, I'm not ready for it to go live, I'll just hit save and the students won't see it. Um, so I'll do that right now actually. And I'm going to go back to all pages. And I'm going to show you, so here's my page, so that's what I just created. And I didn't um, publish it. So you'll see there's little clouds. Uh, this gray one means that it's not published. The green ones mean that it's live and it's published. Um, so as long as students have, you've made it available for students to find, then they can click on it and then um, see it. So I'll go ahead and publish that. Page. So now what's the column to the right of that? Um, so these are all oh, settings. Um, so th that's a good question. So what I can do is if I want that page that I just created to be my home page, um, I would click use as front page. So if I do that, and now I go home. So now there's that tiny little content. <laughs> that I entered there. Um, so that page that I just created with you all is now my home page. Um, clearly I don't want that, so I'm going to go back and hopefully I can find <laughs> wherever that was again. Uh, I think it was Welcome to Developmental Psych. Um, so I could delete a page and then you could also click here to edit it. Um, you could also just click the page title to edit as well. Um, one thing you'll also notice is uh, there's a long list of tabs, um, navigation tabs. Um, the ones that are um, not dark, the ones that are really light colored, that means I've turned those off for my students. And the reason that I've done that is because I don't, it, it gets kind of messy, right? So for example, um, files, <laughs> if I click on files, yeah. You know, I've uploaded images, I've uploaded PowerPoints, you know, and it's kind of a mess and really I just don't want students to see that. So I've hidden files and then some of these other things um, I've hidden too just because um, maybe for quizzes, maybe I don't want them to have access to the laundry list of quizzes. Maybe I want them to actually go through those content pages first in order to find the quizzes that they have to participate in. Um, so I'll show you what I mean. 
so um, I tend to use modules as my main navigation. Um, I like the module feature. So what I mean by modules um, is that I can create a, a somewhat orderly um, navigation for, for the students. So, you know, I'm a student, I go to modules. Okay, so this is pretty much where I'm gonna find all of my content. Um, I can actually set modules as the home page. So if you don't want to create a fancy home page like I did, um, you can just make your modules a home page too. So that's also an option. Um, and for me at least, I think it's pretty easy to see, okay, so I'll go here for syllabus content information. Um, this is where unit one content will be, um, et cetera. Excuse me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's subheadings under syllabus. Yeah. What are those exactly? Yes, so under syllabus, I've created, um, so these are pages. So these are the pages that I just showed you. If you go under pages, you click add page. Um, for the syllabus, I could, uh, there's a couple of options, right? You could just upload a PDF file if you created your syllabus that way. Um, and you can, so under this add button, if I uploaded my syllabus as a file, I could click file and then I would find the syllabus sort of in this laundry list of files, and I could add it there so that students could find it there. Um, I could copy the content from the syllabus and put it all into one long page, or I could divide it up into different smaller pages so students really know exactly where to go to find different parts of the syllabus. So, for example, course objectives. So I created this page with course objectives um, under this, under the course objectives, um, how will this objective be assessed? Um, just for fun, I did this. And then um, students know, okay, so I'm taking weekly quizzes in order to understand major biological, cognitive, and social transitions in my lessons. Um, I want them to gain skills, experience evaluating, uh, evaluating research claims, so how, how will we be assessed with this? Well, the unit application assignments, there are three of them. Um, and in class discussion. So that's how I, I will assess that course objective. Excuse me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you leave that as a template for us as we're <laughs> Sure. <to do? laughs> it's, sure. It's, it looks to be really good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I can definitely do that. So what I'll do is um, I'll, I'll just create a, a Word document for you and kind of leave that as a template um, and give you all access to that. So, um, and then your question was, can you just sort of string together these pages within the module? Um, so again, we're within the syllabus module. And there's this nice little next button. I didn't have to put that there, it just is there. And it'll take me to the next um, page within that module. So here's the course requirements. Um, so these are their different assignments. Um, the reason these are uh, linked as blue is because I've actually linked them to the assignments. Um, so this is linked to the quizzes, this is linked um, to the assignments, so here's the application assignment, so they would just have to click that and it takes them to, oh, here's a description of the um, assignment, oh, here's the rubric that the instructor has created and added. Um, so you can link all of those things. And again, that's just all done with the rich content editor um, in the page, right? So if I want to. But you, you have to create those other pages first. You do. Other yeah. you or do. else when you're on the page that's the course requirements, you can't find them in the files. To them. Right, exactly. Yep, so you'll create them ahead of time. Um, can you scroll down a little bit? Yeah, of course. To the where you had your rubric, is it in that? Oh yeah, here, let me save. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, it was in the application assignment. There. And in the edit, did you put that there? I did, yep. So Under if you the due date and the points and mm -hmm. Yeah, so there? if I <laughs> want to, <laughs> so if I want to add a rubric, so you would, so the thing about rubrics is they're not where you think they yeah, would be. Yeah, that's what I'm They're not where you think they would be. Okay, so, so right now. You do a very good job of hiding them. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So right now yeah. we are under um, under editing an assignment. So I've created this assignment. 
and oh, there's a laundry list of things. I can decide how many points. I can, um, I can make it a group assignment. I can require peer reviews, which we'll do here in a second because someone wants me to do that. Um, so I can grade a due date, all that stuff. But rubrics are not down there. Rubrics, I thought we're here. After you publish it, go back to the assignment. That's right. <laughs> this is why I asked because I figured uh -huh. it was complicated. Right, right, right. <laughs> I haven't seen that before. And uh -huh. you already have a rubric added here, have but if you didn't have a rubric added here, no. under the edit button, there would be an option under that edit and button. Edit well, button. okay. Actually, Hopefully. Hang on, let me create a new assignment yeah. and we'll do it together. Okay. So now we're creating a new assignment, and where is the rubric button? It's not there. It's got to publish it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sample. On behalf of Instructure, the makers of Canvas, yeah. I apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> and apologize for the next thing you're going to see us and where rubrics actually are. Oh, there we go. Okay. Ah, okay. So okay, here, okay, okay. so once yes. you save it and publish it, then you get the lovely ad rubric. The reason it wasn't there is because I already created yeah. it. I think okay. just save. The other way to get to rubrics is to click on outcomes. And you can do that over mm -hmm. on the navigation menu over there. Uh -huh. Again, all of the stuff that's grayed out, you can see as instructors, but your students can't see. And now over here, <laughs> rubrics is obviously in that little Under dot, the dot, 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 dot button. Manage rubrics. Yeah. Manage rubrics. Could you show us how to create a rubric? Yeah. Add rubric. OK. One thing I will say about rubrics is uh, you'll want to plan ahead. Um, I would type out the language that you want to use in a Word document and save it in your course, your own personal course folder on your desktop. Um, and then what you can do is copy and paste that content into this. Uh, you, can, you can approach this a few different ways. So for example, um, you could be really clear and um, descript in your criteria. So, you know, I want you to um, complete all components. Uh, one, two, three. And then um, you get to decide what these ratings are. So if I want it to be, if I want this to be maybe out of two points, um, Two points is going to be full marks. Maybe I don't really need to make a comment because I've been so descript uh, over here. Um, or maybe I want to be really specific in each component, right? So maybe I want to say, um, uh, you mentioned, so let's see, we'll say mentioned all topics. Um, let's say I want to add say I want to also add a one point. So if you hit that little double arrow, that'll give you another rating. Um, or I can delete it. I can click that X and it'll go away. Or I can create it again. Um, missed one topic. Uh, and uh, right, and then you can sort of keep going. I'm going to hit create rubric, and then if I want to go back to my assignments, um, here's that new assignment we just created. Say I want to add a rubric. I can find that rubric that I just created. So this is interesting. You'll see on the far left all of the courses that she is part of yep. or associated with as, as an instructor. She can yep. go back and choose from. So if you have multiple courses and you're like, you know that rubric that I made in this course would be really good in this other course, you can go find that rubric in the, the How about course. from Learn at UW rubrics? We have, um, I haven't do, converted over yet. Do Learn at UW rubrics um, transfer over? I'm trying to think. We have had an active teaching lab with Dan Pell, and did he do that? I think he found that it was easier to recreate them in Canvas. Mm -hmm. I believe that that's what we... Do you remember, Karen? What was that? The rubrics in, in D12, do they transfer over? They do I don't remember anything they do about not, that. Says. Yeah. Do these, do these rubrics 
Um, can they all add up to create your, your, your grade system? I mean, how, how do, how, how's the whole grading system related to these individual rubrics? Yeah, so, um, so for example, if I open, um, so here is a graded discussion, and we had people participate. The one thing is it's a little difficult to show um, considering I don't have any students in this course. Yeah. But what I can do is, so here's a, here's an assignment that, for example, I've created. Let's see, what is the other this is? I want an assignment. Um, there we go. Okay. So say your students have submitted it. Now you can go to SpeedGrader. Um, and uh, so here you see what you would see if you had student submissions, right? So here's test student, here's num their number student one of one. Um, you would click these arrows to get maybe to the next student. Um, I can view rubric here. I can change how this looks, right? So the rubric's nice and visible, the student assignment is nice and visible. And instead of, you know, entering in points, I can just because I've done all the work ahead of time on this rubric, I can just really quickly boop, 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 save. Well, so, so the, the, for this particular uh, assignment, mm -hmm. you give them a total of 15 points. Is that 15 out of the total 100 points or something like that? Is, is that how, how the rubric is, is, is related to the total grade for the course? Um, so this then, this assignment appears in the grade book. So if you go to grades, then we see here's the application assignment. So we would show up under the application assignment. And you set up the grading system ahead of time, please. Yes. Right? It well, automatically, so when you create an assignment, yeah, you can't. it automatically creates a grade item. Right. If you're grading and you don't want the students to see that you've entered the grades, you actually have to go in and hide sort of hide that you're grading it, and then reopen it again. It's called yeah, to that's, assignment. that's one of my biggest uh, changes from D2L to Canvas, that you can't just create a grade, you have to create an assignment, and then decide what the grade of it will be. And then that puts it in your grade book. Um, and, if, and, and also there's no drop boxes in Canvas, so if you want to create a place for them to submit something, you have to create an ungraded assignment. You have to create an assignment, otherwise there's no place for them to submit whatever it is. But, 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 but it's, all, it's all based on creating the assignments. The canvas is not going to say, well, you know, the total grade for this course is 100, okay, so I'm going to, so, but if I keep on adding assignments, I can go over to one, uh, over 100, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And so yeah. that, 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 that doesn't matter? No. Yeah, you're in control of it. Yeah. Can you weight different groups or yeah. categories? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. set that up in your grades. Yeah. Area. We make assignment groups. Okay. Oh, and then you, you say yeah. what weight each group has. Mm -hmm. Okay. Daniel Pell in in, um, in the English department has spent a lot of time looking at rubrics, um, and he gave a, a really good active teaching lab um, discussion on how he's used rubrics and how he changed from D2L to Canvas. Um, it was a really good session. So we have, I put a link to the demo, in the demo thing to that lab. Um, there's two more things I wanted to demo and then, but really quick question. Yeah, um, I was just wondering if you can go the opposite way. So you set up like the grade book and then you create assignments and link yeah. them to grade book items. Or if you have to go from assignments to grade no. book. Okay. You have to do the assignments. assignments to grade book. Yeah. This is a, Grab a whiteboard, plan it out All right. ahead of time. Yeah. And then, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So just two more quick things I wanted to um, demo. So we had a question about uh, peer grading. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and edit this assignment. And say I wanted um, I wanted people to peer review, and I wanted each student to receive two peer reviews and to give two peer reviews. Okay. Um, so here there's a nice little button that says require peer reviews. 
Um, you have a few different options here. Okay, you can manually assign peer reviews. So if you have a smaller class and you know that students are already maybe in teams um, and you want them to peer review specific students, you can manually assign. Um, or you can hit automatically assign peer reviews. Um, and so in my example, so I want re uh, reviews per user. So I'm gonna have, I'm gonna say two here, right? Because that'll mean that um, they will offer two and they will then also receive two peer reviews. And then this right here says assign reviews and there's a little calendar. Um, and what this, what this is, is it, this is when um, the system will automatically assign those peer reviews. Now, uh, you may be tempted to make this happen at the same time that the due of the due date, but you might want to wait. <laughs> you might want to give it maybe 24 hours um, after the due date. And the reason for that is there are always folks that are going to be submitting it a little bit late, um, right? Who maybe don't just make that deadline, maybe five minutes late, 10 minutes late, whatever. Um, maybe you want to wait 48 hours. Maybe you want to wait through the weekend. Um, and then have, and then set it, set the date to assign reviews. And the reason for that is if people don't submit something on time, then they're not in the pool and they won't be considered in the automatic assignment of peer reviews. So they'll be left out of that entirely and you have to manually <coughs> sort of enter them into that. Um, but it's a really nice feature if you have a ton of students and you wanna do peer reviews, um, as long as you sort of keep, keep in mind that timing you can also make the peer reviews appear anonymously. You can do that as well. Yeah. So does that mean that the reviewer is anonymous? And then is the original paper that they're reading that is evaluated anonymously? Uh, I don't think it does anything to the submitted assignment. So the submitted assignment, like it does peer reviewer know who they're evaluating, so it should be anonymous. So if they su if they upload a, a Word doc with their name on it, that'll still be there. But if it's uh, like if you had a series of questions and entered as an assignment in Canvas, uh -huh. would it have their name on it then if they don't enter it? I don't know. Shouldn't, it, shouldn't all of that be done anonymously in terms of student privacy? So you can use student uh, IDs rather than. I think even student IDs would apply with. Really? I think, no, I think because they're in the class, yeah, the class yeah. it's, it's okay that they see each other's stuff. But whether it does it or not, I don't know the answer. Okay. Whether Because in the speed grader, you see that little picture and their name on it, unless you turn that off, right? In peer graded, I don't know. I don't know. We want it to be anonymous, so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and we don't want to show that they're evaluating. Well, to avoid cool. the having the name on the document, Right, you could just in, in the instructions say don't put your name on this, or um, yeah. have them just copy and paste the content into a um, say a text box or something. But uh, you, you have the question about if it if their picture appears or their name or from from their Canvas login. So we need somebody to do this this fall. Yeah. Let yeah. us know how it went, and then come give an active teaching lab yeah. on your experiences with it. <laughs> right. All right, one more thing I wanted to show you, and then I'm going to let you all loose into Canvas so that you can try and work with it. All right. um, so really quickly, yeah, try that. Um, so what I did here uh, was create, let's see, I'm going to go here. So I mentioned that um, I have hidden quizzes and discussions and assignments. I've hidden all of that because what I want students to do is I want them to have to go into the pages that I've created. Okay, and in this page, so this says tasks in this module, and I've created a laundry list of things and about how long it'll take them to complete. So I'd like them to read chapter one, um, participate in the module content below. So maybe I'm inserting fun H5P content um, or videos. I want them to participate in this discussion, take a quiz, and maybe submit a summary assignment. So these are just a bunch of different options. So here, this is a Google <laughs> slide that's been embedded. I know, you guys are so tired of it, it's so great. Um, I, if I'm a student and I want to download this as a PDF or as a PowerPoint, I can do that. Can you put PowerPoint instead of Google Slide? You can do PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. One caveat with that is yeah. you only have as an instructor one gig of space. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you have too many PowerPoints on there, that starts to add up. 
Or just store your PowerPoints in box and then. Or yeah, yeah. yeah. You could store your PowerPoints in box and then drive and um, so I've embedded a video here as well. They can um, open it externally if they would like. So here, so what I force the students to do is in order to get to discussion one, they have to go through all that content, right? Whether they're reading it or not, they at least have to scroll through it um, to get to discussion 2.1, um, to get to quiz 2.1. And I've linked these, um, so this will take them to quiz 2.1. Well, I have it linked in 1.2, but again, this is the same course, um, right? And then uh, same thing with the discussion. Um, and again, so this page is all about the biological changes. And then in the next page, they're going to learn about cognitive changes. Um, so you have a lot of control over what you can do. What I encourage you to do is not take on too much, right? Don't put yourself in the panic zone. Um, do what you can handle to start with, okay? Maybe test out embedding some content. Um, maybe try to create a quiz. In your handout for today, um, I've created a few pages for you to get started. Um, now I'd like to challenge you. We have about 15 minutes left, 15, 18 minutes. Um, this is your time to try things out, to ask us questions. We've got some um, consultants here that can provide answers for you. So this is your, you know, this is your time. Use it. Try something out in Canvas that you've never done before. And we're here to kind of support you through that. And then if you want to stay for another hour, we're all going to be here for another hour um, until noon. So um, with that, I'm going to quit talking away at you. Please feel free to flip through these pages. Create something. I've got, um, if you want to just create your uh, profile, you can do that. If you want to learn how to turn off notifications because you're tired of getting emails about our how to teach effectively in Canvas course, right? You can turn that off. Um, create quizzes, peer grading, rubrics, all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to stop talking at you. Um, go ahead and play. If you have questions, we will come around and answer them. Oh, I have a general yeah, 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 question, sure. which is, you made a beautiful course. How long did it take you to to <laughs> Well, um, the last five hours last night. <laughs> <laughs> He's not wrong. I did. I created it um, in a course that I actually took with John last. What was that? Spring? Fall. Fall. Every fall, I teach a, a Delta class, teaching effective teaching with technology. And Julie was mm -hmm. in it. Yeah, and one of our tasks was essentially oh, to create a demo um, course, right? To take our course content and put it um, into Canvas. Now, my approach to this was definitely more of a blended or maybe fully online course. Um, so that's why there's so much sort of interactive content here. Um, or you could do this for a flipped class. Maybe you want them to cover all that content before they come into class, and then you're going to use your class time to do um, group assignments or discussions or something like that. Um, so that's kind of the approach that I took. And yes, it was um, time intensive creating these pages of content, right? Because um, most of this content I took from PowerPoint slides and then sort of um, made it kind of easy language to sort of follow in this format. Um, so that does take some time, but you know, creating the assignments and the quizzes and um, you know, copying pa and pasting items from the syllabus from my syllabus, you know, that didn't. It's a, as much time as it takes to create any course in um, D2L. So again, you know, don't don't challenge yourselves so much. Don't put yourself so far out of the comfort zone because. Um, if you're comfortable, then your students will be comfortable. But if you're not, we would like this as a template. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. What do you find is the easiest way to do voiceover PowerPoint to do the flip of masses? Mm, I mean, I would use Kaltura. Um, I don't know if anyone. I see some nodding. I use PowerPoint. Uh, I use Snagit, this little screen capture thing, and mm -hmm. then I upload the. Yep. Yeah, that's and that's really nice. So if you use a different 
um, software and you can download it as an mp4 and then either upload it if you want to do it as a YouTube video or in Kaltura then you can embed it into your canvas course so that you're not uploading um, videos also, once I'm done, Hudson, once I'm done with the anonymous assignment we should talk because I have a lot of potential ideas that I can okay. talk all the way through okay okay I'll come around and answer your questions otherwise go go go